Hello, my name is Karen Gerstner. I've been a longtime member of St. Andrew's Presbyterian Church. On February 27th, 2022, I gave a presentation on estate planning at St. Andrew's. I handed out a written outline to the people who attended that presentation. The outline is available from St. Andrew's. The presentation was recorded, but due to a technical glitch, the audio portion of the first 14 minutes of the presentation did not get recorded. So I am re-recording the first 14 minutes of the presentation, and hopefully that can be spliced in at the beginning of the presentation so that anyone who wants to view this recording will get the full presentation. Again, I'm speaking from an outline that I've titled An Introduction to Estate Planning, Including Charitable Giving. Uh, I'm, I'm an attorney who specializes in estate planning and probate law. Sometimes that field is also called trusts and estates. Sometimes that field is called wealth transfer. There's a lot of different names, but basically, this is the type of planning that individuals do to provide what happens when they die and also to provide what happens in the event they lose their mental capacity. And technically, at most ages, people are more likely to become disabled than they are to die. So we don't want to just plan for our future death, we want to plan for the possibility that we might at some point during our life become mentally incapacitated. In the first Roman numeral section of my outline, I list some of the goals of estate planning. Of course, people who do estate planning want to ensure that all of their assets of every type go to the correct people in the correct form when they die. In both estate planning and probate and in the Internal Revenue Code, note that the word property is much broader than real property. Sometimes when I give these presentations, if I use the word property, people assume I'm just referring to real estate or real property, but that is not the case. Legally, the word property includes every type of property, real property, tangible personal property, and tangible personal property would be household furnishings, personal effects, jewelry, china, silver, artwork, all those things that can be touched, that's why it's tangible property, and then intangible property. Intangible property is all the different type of accounts people have, bank accounts, brokerage accounts, investment accounts, IRAs, etc. Another reason um, people do estate planning is they want to reduce as much as possible estate taxes, and they also want to provide a good income tax result for their beneficiaries to the extent possible. We can do that in estate planning. That is a major focus of estate planning. Of course, a real primary goal is to provide for your loved ones when you die, to provide for your spouse if you're married, your children, your grandchildren, other individuals that you want to make sure are taken care of after you pass away. Also, you need to think about the fact that when you die, it's the very last time you can make a charitable gift. Many people listening to this presentation make charitable gifts every single year. Those charitable gifts likely include St. Andrew's Presbyterian Church, but there may be additional charities, your college or university, various charities that um, deal with various types of health problems, etc. 
Well, your estate plan is the final time when you can make a charitable gift. So a lot of people do want to include some sort of charitable gift as part of their estate plan. Another goal of estate planning is to use the same assets to provide for multiple individuals. Sometimes a person wants to take care of their spouse, but when their spouse dies, they want the leftover assets this, this would be their leftover assets, not their spouse's personal assets, but they want their leftover assets to go to designated people. For example, in a second marriage, maybe the husband wants his assets to take care of his wife, but when his wife dies, he wants what's left of his assets to go to his children from his first marriage rather than to his wife's children. And so we use a lot of trusts in estate planning. That's an example of a typical type of trust. If you have a minor child or minor children, you also want to be the one to decide who should be their guardian if something happens to you before your children reach adulthood. In Texas, the age of majority is 18. Another thing you want to do is try to protect the inherited assets from being lost due to various bad things. These are things like divorce and lawsuits of every type. We usually do that with a trust for the beneficiary so that the inherited assets can't be taken by the beneficiary's spouse in a divorce, for example, or can't be taken by a plaintiff in a lawsuit. Now I'm going to Roman numeral two. How and why are a person's assets transferred at death? Well, the why is pretty simple. A deceased person cannot legally own anything. So whenever a person dies, whatever that person owned is going to go to a new owner. We call the new owner or owners, there could be more than one, beneficiaries of the deceased person's estate. So that is the why. A deceased person cannot own anything. But how are assets transferred at death? There are really only four transfer methods, methods that can be used for transferring assets at death. Number one, a will. Number two, a revocable trust, which is also called a living trust. Number three, a beneficiary designation form. And number four, a non-probate multi-party arrangement. Now, most people end up using more than one transfer method to transfer their assets when they die, and you'll understand why in a minute. A very important thing to realize, however, is in terms of federal estate taxes, which some people call the death tax, the IRS does not care which transfer method a deceased person uses. Every asset that the deceased person owned at the time of his or her death that is being transferred to a new owner as a result of the deceased person's death is included in the deceased person's estate for federal estate tax purposes, and it doesn't matter what method of transfer is used. So some people that think they should arrange their estate plan to avoid probate and that that will also mean they will avoid estate taxes are incorrect. Um, again, there's four transfer methods and it doesn't matter which method is used. All of the assets owned by the deceased person that are being transferred at death are included in the deceased person's estate for federal estate tax matters. Now, let's talk about the four transfer methods in more detail. Everyone is probably familiar with a will and what the will looks like. The will basically does two things. It names someone who in Texas is called an independent executor to handle the post-death matters that must be handled when someone dies and to make the distribution of all of the assets passing by will. The assets passing by will are called probate assets. 
to be distinguished from the assets that might be passing pursuant to one of the other three methods, which are all non-probate methods of transfer. Now, obviously, not everyone who dies has a will. So if a person dies without a will and they own any probate assets, the state of Texas has written a substitute will for that person, which is called the intestacy laws. And the person may or may not be happy with what those laws provide, so the answer is to have a will. The second method is a revocable trust, also called a living trust. This method is very popular with people who live in one of the 30 bad probate states. Fortunately, we live in one of the 20 easy probate states. In fact, most people agree that Texas has the simplest probate process of all 50 states. So we have less reason in Texas to use a revocable trust or a living trust as our primary estate planning vehicle compared to people who live in the bad probate states. However, there are eight or nine reasons why someone who lives in Texas might still want to use a revocable trust as his or her primary estate planning vehicle. The number one reason being the person lives in Texas, but they own real property in one of the 30 bad probate states. So they create their Texas trust, they deed the California property to their Texas trust, and now they don't have to worry about a second probate in California, an ancillary probate, and California is the worst probate state, so we don't want to go through probate there. And it doesn't matter if you own just one piece of real property or a whole bunch of properties in California, you would have ancillary probate when you die in California, which is a pretty bad thing. The third transfer method applies to almost everybody. These are assets that are transferred solely by a beneficiary designation form. There are four assets in this category, life insurance, IRAs, employee benefit plans, and employee benefit plans includes all types of things, 401k, profit sharing, stock bonus, you name it, and also annuities. And again, not everybody has all four of these, but most people do have at least one of these, in particular an IRA or an IRA rollover. In the case of these type of assets, it is the beneficiary designation form, whether paper or electronic, that is submitted to the insurance company or the IRA custodian or the plan administrator that provides for the transfer from the person who has died to the new owner or owners, the beneficiaries. So a lot of people are going to have either a will or a revocable living trust as their primary estate planning vehicle. And I call it a vehicle because the assets do have to be transported when the deceased person dies. And then they're going to have to carefully structure all of their beneficiary designation forms for things like IRAs, 401k plans, etc. And it really is part of the estate planning attorney's job to help clients do that. The fourth category is non-probate multi-party arrangements. These are things like joint tenants with right of survivorship, pay on death, which is abbreviated POD, and transfer on death, which is abbreviated TOD. And I think we're back to the recorded materials. Okay, so we're talking about the fourth transfer method, which doesn't have a user-friendly name at all, non-probate, multi-party arrangements. This could be accounts. This could be other assets like real estate. The three primary examples of this fourth category would be a joint account titled as joint tenants with right of survivorship, often abbreviated JTWROS, or an individual or a joint account that has a pay on death, which is POD arrangement, or a transfer on death, which is TOD arrangement. 
the banks use POD, the brokerage firms and investment companies use TOD, and to lawyers, these types of arrangements have come to be known as, quote, the poor man's will. There is a place for these, and I have recommended these arrangements sometimes, but only after looking at all the facts and circumstances. And there are a lot of cases I've already had where these arrangements totally destroyed my client's estate plan. And the reason is, when you have an asset or account with one of those arrangements, it will be transferred completely outside your will, completely outside your trust when you die. So everything that you put in your will or your trust that you wanted to happen cannot happen with these assets. They're just completely bypassing your estate plan. And again, the mantra that I find all the time from the financial services industry is people should do this to avoid probate. But again, Texas has the simplest probate of all 50 states. And avoiding probate also means avoid everything that you wanted in your will. So you have to be careful with this category. OK. So now we are going to, I have an example at Exhibit A, and we're just going to walk quickly through a situation. I call this Grandma's Estate Plan. And these are the assets that Grandma owns, her home, her IRA. This was actually a rollover from her husband when he died, um, a brokerage account, bank accounts, a car, household furnishings. She got $4.9 million. And as it says in my example, Grandma said, just assume it's $50,000. That may be too high. But now that's $470,000. So can that amount come out of Grandma's estate? Does it look like this? OK. She's got $4.9 million. OK. No. None of that can come out of grandma's estate plan because of the way that she's arranged her assets, okay? So she's left the home entirely to her daughter. She has named her three children as the equal beneficiaries of her IRA in the beneficiary designation form. She has put a TOD arrangement on a brokerage account because the broker said, you've got to do this, you've got to avoid probate. She named the three kids. Her daughter is on all her bank accounts, and all those accounts are titled joint tenants with right of survivorship. And um, the car is a specific gift to one of her sons, and the household furnishings go to her three kids. We have zero cash, not even any other kind of assets, in the estate passing under the will that can pay the 400,000 in total gifts to the grandchildren, the 20,000 to the church, the 50,000 in all of the post-death expenses. So this plan doesn't work. But, you know, and I'm not going to go through every part of that, but it's um, in your materials, Exhibit A. And so this just points out that, yeah, Grandma has a pretty large estate, but what she wants isn't going to happen. OK, so when you're the estate planning lawyer, you know, you can draft the will to say what grandma wants, but then you have to start looking at how are the brokerage accounts titled? How are the bank accounts titled? Are they going to be completely outside the will and that means totally unavailable to the executor to pay the cash gifts in the will, to pay the post-death charges? And IRAs, they're normally going to be completely outside the will, so we just have to recognize that. So this is just an example where you really have to pay attention to which particular transfer method applies to each of the assets. And so, you know, my advice to grandma would be, take that TOD off your brokerage account. If we had two million passing through the will, now the executor can pay the 50,000 to each of the eight grandchildren, can pay the 20,000 to St. Andrews, can pay the debts, taxes, expenses, all the post-death charges, and then the leftover amount will go to the three kids in equal shares. And I also point out, here's a case where she left the entire home to her daughter, and my question would be, did she really want her daughter to have that as an extra gift 
compared to the other children, or was the home supposed to be part of the daughter's share? And the daughter's also getting these bank accounts. And people will say, well, that's cash. What if the daughter uses that to pay? Well, first of all, it's not enough to pay everything. It's 350000 But second of all, the right of survivorship actually has a legal effect that means when grandma dies, the daughter becomes the sole exclusive owner of everything in those accounts to the exclusion of her brothers, and it's not part of the estate. If she uses any of that to satisfy any of the gifts, or if she uses any of it to share with her brothers, IRS says she's making a taxable gift. She has to report that in a gift tax return to the IRS. Even if she uses to pay the funeral expenses, she's making a gift. So we have a lot of issues here beyond this simple, you know, put that, put that TOD on every account. Okay, so let's see. I wonder if I'm skipping a page. Let me see. I should have said something in the beginning, and that is in the tax laws and in the state laws, the word property means every type of asset. But I notice sometimes when I'm speaking to people, if I use the word property, because that's what the tax code uses everywhere, that's what the probate code, the trust code, people think I just mean real estate. No, property is every kind of asset. So you've got real estate, you've got tangible personal property, things you can touch, your household furnishings and personal effects. You've got intangible personal property. That's your bank accounts, your brokerage accounts. So the word property, if I make a mistake and say property instead of assets, I don't mean just real property. Okay. All right. I just want to make a point here on Roman numeral three, because over the years, I've been practicing 41 years now, I've had many situations where a person wrote his or her own will. And this is before we even had legal Zoom. They just wrote it themselves. And I think that people think, well, it's just English language is pretty simple. <laughs> and uh, we, always, we always had to go to court and have the judge straighten out the will because most lay people don't even understand how a will should be structured. And what I see when they write their own, and this has gotten better now that we have these software programs because the software programs are gonna keep people to the right structure. But in the past, People write a will and they would itemize everything they own and stop. That's not how you write a will. So a well-drafted will and also well-drafted revocable trust, the first part you're gonna identify what we call the testator or testatrix, that's the person making the will, or the trustor, which is the person making the trust. You're gonna identify them, identify all their family members, then the next part is usually the appointment of fiduciaries. Fiduciary is a catch-all word, comes from the Latin word, um, you know, which is the base of fidelity, which is trustworthy, all of that. So you're appointing executors and trustees in a will. You're appointing trustees and trustee appointers in the trust. That comes next. Then you come to dispositive provisions. And dispositive means provisions where the person is making gifts of assets. They're disposing of their assets. And remember, they're only disposing of the assets that are passing pursuant to that document, okay? They can't dispose of the IRA by what they put in their will or their trust, because that's okay. But the dispositive prov provisions have two different parts. The first part is specific gifts. An example of a specific gift is $20,000 to St. Andrews or $50,000 to each grandchild who survives me. You also frequently have specific gifts of tangible personal property. You know, jewelry, china, silver, vehicles, all of that is usually specific gifts. But then there's another dispositive section that is technically called the residuary estate. And it means everything else that is passing pursuant to this particular transfer document. In a trust, it would be called remaining trust property. In a will, residuary estate. But it, it's the catch-all. And you don't, you don't want the catch-all to have nothing in it because it's the residuary that pays the post-death charges. And I listed some of them in the paper. So your funeral expenses, 
the deceased person's final income taxes, the debts, those are the bills that come in. If there's real estate, you've got maintenance charges, utilities, property taxes, and you've got accounting fees, legal fees. All of those things get paid out of the residuary or the remaining trust property before the net leftover amount goes to what are called the residuary beneficiaries. And that part of a will or trust is going to be in percentages. It's not going to be in dollar amounts. The dollar amounts are up in the specific gift section. The residuary is percentages. And of course, the percentages have to add up to 100. I remember when I was a baby lawyer, we had a giant case in Houston, very wealthy man died. There's buildings named for him all over the place. And every, and I worked for one of the four big law firms. So every big law firm was involved. Even the boutique firms were involved. Everybody was involved. And the first problem was he had a will and seven codicils. Those are amendments. That's a bad thing right there. You don't want to have seven codicils. But by the time you went through it, he had disposed of 102% of his estate. That was just the first of many problems, but it was eye-opening. And, and for many years, my law partners did probate litigation. That's what they specialized in. They were excellent at it. And I like to do planning. I don't like to deal with problems and messy situations. I like to prevent the problem. But when you have partners doing that kind of work, it's very eye-opening. And you see all these different problems are caused almost always by bad, bad planning of some sort. Almost always, not always, because sometimes they're just families where, I mean, everybody is kind of dysfunctional, what can I say? But, um, okay, so then you have your residuary, okay? So you want to have enough in that residuary at least to pay the post-death charges. Okay, so what if somebody dies and they don't have a will? Well, they might have some assets that are being transferred by another method. Maybe they got a 401k and they filled out the beneficiary designation form, which is good. So at least for their 401k, they hopefully put what they wanted on the form. Hopefully that updated that form as there were changes. But if they have any, quote, probate assets, and this is a bad definition. Probate assets means assets that are transferred by will. You can see how circular that is. So really, what we have to go back to, and remember the four transfer methods, methods two, three, and four are non-probate transfer methods. Two, three, and four are non-probate transfer methods. So everything that's not being distributed pursuant to one of those methods is by default a probate asset transferred by will. Well, if a person dies without a will, the Texas legislature has written a will for that person, those are called the intestacy laws. So intestate really means a person who dies without a will. Uh, and so they say who gets what. And sometimes those default rules might be okay, but a lot of times it's not what the person wants. And if the person who died had minor children, the court is going to pull all the assets into the court itself to be managed for the minor children. That's probably not what the parents want. And that kind of proceeding in the court is very expensive. And the minor children's inheritance gets totally wasted. And if there's anything left when they turn 18, which is the legal age of majority, they just get it all at one time, which is usually not good either. We had a law professor that said, if you give an 18-year-old liquid assets, he'll drink them. So we don't want a large amount going to an 18-year-old at one time. So we have problems. You don't want to be in this situation. And let me mention something about the, the revocable trust. We do use it. I mean, I would say 20% of my clients use a revocable trust, and probably 80% of the 20% is because they have real property in one of the bad probate states, and we have to get out of California probate when they die. But there's other reasons why we might use it. But even if you're using a revocable trust or living trust as your primary estate planning vehicle, you're still going to have a will. It's going to be a totally different kind of will. It's not going to be a dispositive will that, you know, goes through all the different kinds of assets. It's going to be what we call a pour over will. 
And the purpose of having a pour over will is if the person who died didn't get everything into their trust before they died and they have any probate assets, we still have to probate their will. But it's a pour over will. And what it says is pour over into my trust all of my probate assets for further administration and distribution according to what it says in my trust. Okay. Um, when should you change your will or other estate planning documents? So this includes your beneficiary designation forms too. Okay, maybe your personal situation has changed. You were married before, now you're single, or you were single, single before, now you're married. Or people in the family have been born and other people in the family have died. Or the people you've named in fiduciary positions, executor, trustee, agent, they've moved to Australia, or they've died, or they're no longer appropriate, or you move to another state. So everything I'm telling you today is only about Texas. If you move to another state, you're going to have to redo your documents. And that's because the Texas documents are only dealing with Texas law, and they're not going to deal with Oklahoma or Michigan or some other state. So when you move, you do have to go and see an estate planning lawyer in your new state and make some changes in most cases. Okay, so here's something important. A will or a trust is not the only thing you need because when we're doing estate planning, we're not just planning for death, we're also planning for the possibility that we might lose our mental capacity at some point in our life. So there's a lot of other documents that everybody should have. There is a financial power of attorney. So you're in a car accident, you have a head injury, you no longer have mental capacity. You need somebody to pay your bills, make investment decisions, keep your house up, you know, do anything financial. And you don't want the court to do it if you don't have this financial power of attorney. And in Texas, we pretty much use what's called the statutory durable power of attorney. If you don't have that and you're in the car accident, you have the head injury, the court is taking control of all of your assets. And they're going to get wasted because that kind of proceeding is very expensive and you don't want that. There's also a medical power of attorney. Same idea. You were in the car accident. You had the head injury. Medical decisions have to be made, but you don't have sufficient mental capacity to do that and you don't want the court doing that. So you name one or more medical agents in your medical power of attorney, and those people can make the medical decisions for you. Obviously, these agents that you're appointing need to be trustworthy people, prudent people, people who will um, listen to advice from professionals like the investment people, the doctors, whoever it is. So you really have to spend a lot of time figuring out who would be a good choice to be in these positions because these are these are very powerful documents um, and you don't micromanage things in these documents you give very broad powers to your agents so they do need to be someone you trust completely now a directive to physicians which is also called a living will is one particular medical decision that you are permitted to make for yourself in advance in case you ever find yourself in that situation there are two prerequisites for that document to apply. Both have to be true. Number one, the doctors who are treating you have diagnosed you as having some sort of incurable disease or illness. That's number one. You yourself can't decide that. Okay, number two, you have lost your mental capacity so that you can no longer make or communicate your own medical decisions. But in this directive to physicians or living will, you can state right now in advance, if I'm ever in this situation where I have an incurable disease or illness and my brain is not working and it's not temporary, my brain is not working, you can say whether you would or would not want to be kept alive with life support machines or have any more chemo or radiation or experimental treatments. You can decide. And, and it took a lot of court cases to get this. And, um, you know, 41 years ago, we had the Karen Quinlan case. Well, she was 19 years old, went to a party 
took drugs and alcohol, destroyed her brain, but she had a young, healthy body. They took her to the hospital, they put her on a ventilator, and her family found out from their doctors that she was basically brain dead, but on this machine, and her body was healthy. And her family went up and down through the court several times. The court said, well, we don't know what she would want. She didn't have any kind of a document. Um, and so her family actually went bankrupt going up and down through the courts between the legal fees and the hospital fees. But finally, they got a ruling that they could take her off this ventilator or respirator. She still lived several more years because she had a healthy body. But, you know, so, but it took a lot of court cases because back then, this is 40 years ago, doctors and hospitals were worried about liability. They're trained to sustain life almost at all costs. They don't want to be in a position where someone can say they've assisted someone to die, you know, like assisted suicide. But we've had many court cases since then. You do not, if you're in that position, you have incurable disease or illness and your brain is not working, you do not have to keep going and trying every possible experimental thing or be hooked up to machines. That is not suicide. So that's clear now. And I think the medical community understands this way better now than they did 40 years ago. And we've had many more cases. Okay, a HIPAA authorization. Everybody in here already has one with their doctor or dentist. But we prepare a global HIPAA authorization that could present, be presented to anyone, anywhere. You might be traveling and in an accident, you're in a hospital, you know, out of town. HIPAA is the federal law that includes anyone in the healthcare field from disclosing anything at all about your protected health information to anyone but you. Well, what if you want them to talk to your spouse or your adult children? Well, your adult child might call the hospital, but if there's no HIPAA authorization signed by the parent, the hospital has to hang up the phone. They can't even admit that the parent's in the hospital. So everybody needs a global HIPAA authorization. If you have minor children, you're gonna to wanna to be the one who determines who should be their guardians if you die before they reach adulthood. You don't want the court making that choice. This one, number six, most people don't need number six. It's where you declare a guardian for yourself in case you ever need it. The reason I say most people don't need it is most people are going to have the financial power of attorney and the medical power of attorney, and those people are going to handle their financial and medical matters without a legal guardianship that's in the courts. However, there is a useful situation for this number six, the declaration of guardian for yourself. And that is where you have a closely related family member who might try to get control over you and your assets. If you lose your mental capacity and you don't want that person ever to be appointed as your guardian. So I look at that one as more of a defensive document that keeps this person who could be appointed by the court because they're closely related as a guardian and take control of all your assets and you. It's keeping them out, and that is absolutely binding on the court. And some people say, ooh, does, does this person have to know about it? I say, no, they wouldn't have to know about it unless they tried to become your guardian, and then you need these people to present that document to the court that shows that, no, that person cannot be appointed. Okay, um, we already talked about beneficiary designation forms, and that's really important. And the lawyer who does the estate planning, who creates the will or the trust, is the one who needs to help that client fill out all their beneficiary designation forms because we're trying to coordinate everything. Marital property agreements. A lot of people still think this is just for rich and famous people, movie stars. No, it's for everybody because all, mar all marriages terminate, okay? They terminate either by death or divorce. And the divorce rate is 50%. Guess what? The death rate is 100%. So you're, you're going to have a marriage terminate at some point. Um, in a second marriage situation, it's vitally important, you don't have to be rich and famous, that we have a marital property agreement that outlines exactly who owns what. So when the marriage terminates, and I don't do any divorce work, 
But I see the problems when the first spouse dies and the marriage terminates, when it's a second marriage and there wasn't any kind of a marital property agreement. Number one, you have a legal presumption that all the assets are community property. That's where you start. And that means all the assets. Um, and to overcome that legal presumption, you have to present clear and convincing evidence, which is the highest burden of proof in civil law. It's hard to do. And if the second marriage was for a long period of time, you're probably going to end up with all the assets being treated as community property, which may or may not be what the couple was thinking when they got into this second marriage. They might have been thinking, okay, these assets in the wife's name are the wife's separate property. These assets in the husband's name are the husband's separate property. That doesn't fly in Texas. We're not a title state. The other states are title states, the ones that are not community property. We're a community property state. The title does not tell us the owner, only tells us the manager. So you can have many, many community property assets in Texas. They're titled in just one spouse's name, for example, an IRA. But all the accumulations in the IRA during the marriage, that's community property. The IRA is community property. This is important because when a person dies, that person is only entitled to dispose of what he or she owns. If it's a married person who dies, the married person owns one half of the community property and his or her separate property, if any. They cannot dispose of their spouse's half of the community property. But it happens all the time because a lot of people don't understand how our community property system works. And they think just because something's titled in one spouse's name, that that spouse is the 100% owner. We also are unique. There's only three states in the United States, Texas is one, that has a rule that causes separate property brought into the marriage to become community property over time anyway. And that is all income of every type during the marriage, including income earned by the assets brought into the marriage, that's community property. And what happens? So the spouse has a separate account in their name before they get married. They don't change it when they get married. They don't do a marital property agreement. Interest in dividends go into that account for 20 years. Interest in dividends, that's community property going into the same account. That's called a commingled account. So this is very important. You don't have to be rich and famous. Okay. Irrevocable trust, that's kind of beyond today. We use them a lot. And I have had some people come in and say, I don't like trusts. And to me, that's like saying, I don't like vegetables. I mean, there's, you know, I don't know how many dozens of vegetables there are. Well, there's dozens of trusts and they're very useful for a lot of different situations. All right, in the last few minutes, we're gonna focus on charitable giving, charitable planning. Have an exhibit that gives you the um, income tax deduction limitations for charitable gifts made during life. So there are limitations. We're temporarily uh, under a slightly higher amount uh, of a limitation. I don't want to focus so much on lifetime giving here. I want to talk more about testamentary charitable giving, things that happen when you pass away. The good news is, there is, unlike the percentage limitations during life for charitable gifts, like how much is deductible, for estate tax when someone dies, you get a 100% deduction for qualified charitable gifts made at death. I put one case in your material, I'm not gonna spend time on it, it's kind of a unique situation, but generally it's a 100% charitable deduction at death. So the simplest way to make a charitable gift at death is put a specific cash gift in your will or your revocable trust. You know, I give $25,000 to St. Andrew's Presbyterian Church. Remember how we talked about you have a specific section. Now, I put a trap in there with the wording. You don't want to just say cash because there have been some judges that decided that the charitable gifts could not be made because there was not enough cash in the estate when the person died. So we say cash or other property payable out of my estate. So if there's investments like stocks or bonds or mutual funds, they could be sold to produce cash. Or 
the charity could just receive, instead of 25,000 of cash, 25,000 of Apple stock. It just goes right to the charity. Okay, and remember, 100% charitable deduction at death. Here's another thing you can do. Remember with the structure of a will or trust, you come to the remaining part, which is percentages. You could leave a percentage of your residuary estate to one or more charities. Um, I've had people leave 10% of their residuary estate to their church at death, okay? So that's percentages there instead of dollar amounts. Now, what about people that change their mind all the time about which charities, and they don't want to keep paying the lawyer to update their legal documents? Well, we have a solution for this. It's a wonderful solution called the Donor Advised Fund. So you can create a donor advised fund with any brokerage firm, Vanguard has one, Fidelity has one, or with any community foundation. I have one of those with Houston Christian Foundation. And we have other, there's a Jewish Community Foundation, and there's a Greater Houston Community Foundation. But you can open a donor advised fund, and you can use it during life too. It's not just for these gifts at death, but it solves the problem of people who come in every few years and they've changed their mind on which charities and how much they want to give each charity. So let's say they know they want to give a total of 10% to one or more charities. Their will or trust could just say, I leave 10% to my donor advised fund, account number such and such with Fidelity Charitable, to be distributed pursuant to my final instructions that I provided provided to fidelity. So the will doesn't have to be changed. If they're still happy with the 10%, and now they just do a new set of instructions and submit it to Fidelity Charitable in that case and say, here are the particular charities and here are the percentages each of them is supposed to receive of what's already in the donor advised fund when I die and what comes into the donor advised fund from my will or my trust when I die. So we love this. Clients love this. We, we love this. Okay. Um, you could also leave the remainder interest in a personal residence to a charity. And this is where you actually um, execute a deed and you file and record the deed. And what you're doing is you're keeping a life estate. For the rest of your life, you continue to live in your home. But when you die, because of that recorded deed, the remainder interest, the, you know, which is the interest after you die, that goes to charity. So now the charity becomes the owner of the home when you die, and they could sell it and, and take the cash from the sale. Um, okay, number six. Um, this might be the last one we talk about. No, I'll, no I'm going to talk about A2. Okay, number six. Um, this is really fantastic. This has become even more popular ever since the SECURE Act became law on January 1 of 2020. The SECURE Act made huge changes to the income tax rules and the distribution period of what are called inherited IRAs. Inherited IRAs are what the beneficiary of an IRA sets up when the IRA owner dies or the participant in a plan like a 401k plan, that beneficiary sets up an inherited IRA. Before the SECURE Act, if that beneficiary qualified as what's called a designated beneficiary, they could take required minimum distributions from the inherited IRA over their life expectancy. And if they were someone in their 40s, they had a 40-year distribution period during which to drain that inherited IRA. So somebody who really wanted to maximize tax-free growth inside that inherited IRA. And I'm really talking about a pre-tax IRA or a pre-tax employee benefit plan, not a Roth, okay? Roth is different, but so 40 years. I mean, that's a very small percentage that has to come each year out each year. And when you're talking about a pre-tax inherited IRA, every distribution is taxable as ordinary income, not capital gain, ordinary income in the year of receipt. So lots and lots of taxes. Secure Act threw all that out. I knew it was going to happen. This is what we call low-hanging fruit for the government. There's $32 trillion in 
IRAs, 401k plans. There's a lot. And Congress decided it was never their intention to allow able-bodied adult children to have this good deal where they could just take out a little each year over 40-some years and spread out the income taxes. That was not the purpose of ERISA. The purpose of ERISA was to assist employees and their spouses to have retirement money for the employee and their spouse, not to have this really good deal for their adult able-bodied children. Secure Act now, January 1, 2020. All these people with inherited IRAs have to take everything out within 10 years. What a difference that is. Huge amounts and a huge acceleration of income taxes. So people that have a charitable intent should think about naming one or more charities, it could be their donor advised fund, because then they could split it as a beneficiary of maybe an entire IRA or a percentage of an IRA. And that way they're avoiding both income taxes and estate taxes. Sometimes the combined rate is 77% when it's an individual because you have a 37% top income tax rate and a 40% estate tax rate. But if whatever amount goes directly from the IRA to one or more charities or a donor advised fund at death, no income taxes, no estate taxes, the charity gets 100% of it. So this has become even more, I was always doing it before the SECURE Act because whenever somebody told me they had a charitable intent and I saw a pre-tax IRA, I said, this is what we ought to use. But now with the SECURE Act makes even more sense because the children, you know, they're gonna get pennies on the dollar. Okay, I'm gonna skip number seven. That's kind of sophisticated. I'm gonna to go to number eight. There is a lifetime charitable giving situation that people who are 70 and a half and older really ought to use, especially if they don't need their required minimum distribution. Now the SECURE Act changed the age when a living person has to start taking required minimum distributions from his or her qualified plan or IRA. It was 70 and a half before the SECURE Act. It's now 72. They're even proposing to change it to 75. Okay. That's just the date by, again, a person who is, is their particular IRA or plan. It's not an inherited IRA. That's a different category, okay? But now um, they have to start taking required minimum distributions at age 72. We just got brand new tables, which allow for a little bit longer distribution period, which is good. But the SECURE Act did not change the fact that a person who's 70 and a half make a qualified charitable distribution, a QCD, directly from that person's pre-tax IRA to one or more charities. The limit is a total of 100,000 per year. So let's say, but you don't have to do 100,000. Let's say the person's required minimum distribution once they reach 72 is 45,000 a year and they don't need it, they don't want that but they have one or more charities that they could have that 45,000 go to, they make a QCD, Qualified Charitable Distribution. The money goes directly from their IRA to charity. They don't pay any income taxes on that. Normally they'd have to take that 45,000 into income and pay income taxes on it. But instead that QCD counts as if they took the 45,000, but they're not gonna get an income tax bill on that 45,000 because it went directly to charity. Now, caveat, you cannot use this with a donor advised fund, okay? That's one thing you cannot do. This can only be a public charity like St. Andrews, um, but it's a great thing. I can't wait till I'm 70 and a half so I can start doing this because it's, you know, money that I'll avoid paying income taxes on and it can help me satisfy my charitable intent. Okay. We don't have time to talk about the federal estate tax. I'm only going to make two points here. Number one, the federal estate tax is a transfer tax. It is a tax on the privilege you have in America. We're not living in China. The privilege you have of transferring assets you own when you die. 
So it's a type of excise tax, which is how it doesn't violate the Constitution. You remember from civics class, the US government is not allowed to levy a direct property tax on citizens. It kind of looks like it because you value everything you own and you've got this tax. But there has to be a transfer. So for example, those people that had themselves buried in their, you know, 1956 Thunderbird Cadillac, they didn't have to pay estate taxes on the Cadillac because they didn't transfer it to anybody. They used it themselves. So there had to be a transfer. Um, and the same with the gift tax. And so the, the tax is imposed on the person making the transfer, not the recipient, the person making the transfer or their estate. That's who has to pay the tax. The only other, other thing I want to point out is, yes, we have a very large estate tax exemption right now because it's the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. We're at 12060000 Less than 2% of the people who die right now will have a taxable estate. But the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act is already set to expire December 31 of 2025. When we get to 2026, that exemption is dropping to $5 million. It's really right now 10 million and it has been adjusted by inflation to get up to 12 million 60. But in the year 2026, it's going back to 5 million. It will have inflation adjustments, but there will be more people with a taxable estate when we get to 2026 and the exemption dropped to 5 million. Now, could Congress change that before we get there? Yes, they could. Last year, the Democrats wanted to change it so that this year would drop to 5 million. That didn't get passed last year. But here's the other really big point. Married couples do not automatically get two exemptions from the estate tax. Even though a married couple consists of two people, there's no automatic two exemptions. So if a married couple needs or wants two exemptions, and some couples right now, um, 12 million is not enough. They'd rather have 24 million of exemption. They have to do something to get that. They either have to create something called a bypass trust in their will or living trust instrument and make sure assets will make it in there so they're not using some of those I don't want to call them bad <laughs> forms of title, but the ones that don't work with the estate plan. Or they can make what's called a portability election by filing a federal estate tax return. And on page four, you say to the IRS, my spouse died, my spouse left everything directly to me, so I now own 100%. But I want two exemptions, not just one. So I hereby transport my spouse's unused exemption to myself but you have to do something. If you don't do one of those two things, then when the second spouse dies, there's only one exemption and a 40% estate tax. Okay, I'm not gonna talk about this, but I just wanna point out a misconception. Everybody thinks that everything that happens when someone dies is probate. Not true. There are three parts to the post-death process. Probate, federal tax matters, payment of the post-death charges and the distribution and retitling of the assets, including setting up and funding, putting assets into trusts that are created at death. So even somebody who manages to skip part one, probate, and some people could arrange their affairs with either a revocable trust or all beneficiary designations, or there's non-probate multi-party arrangements, they might skip part one, but guess what? They still have to do part two and part three. And it's easier to do part two and part three if you have either an executor in a will or a trustee in a living trust. If you don't have anything like that, it's gonna be, you know, you're not gonna be able to do these other parts. So, uh, and my clients find part two horrible. This is IRS part. And IRS is very persnickety and difficult to deal with. So it is kind of a horrible part, but it's not fair to blame that on probate. Um, probate is state law. The federal tax matters, that's federal tax law. So, okay, so we went through a lot. Um, I know that was a lot to cover, but I did put a lot of information in your outline so that you can go back and look at all this you know, in your spare time. <laughs> and if anybody ever has any questions, you can send me an email. And people that want this outline, 
that didn't get it here today uh, could email Jeff, and Jeff will send the outline. Thank you.